Hello, welcome to Adventures Among Ideas. Well, on a previous episode, I talked about a um, I talked about classic dualistic theories of the mind. So we had interactionism, where mind and matter are different subst substances capable of um, affecting each other. We had parallelism, in which mind and matter are different substances that kind of flow alongside each other without affecting each other. And then we had epiphenomenalism, in which uh, matter, or the brain, produces mind, but mind has no subsequent effect on matter. Uh, today I want to focus on monistic views of the mind, monisms which view mind and as uh, mind and matter as the same kind of stuff. So again, I'll talk about three theories. We've got our panpsychism in which man uh, in which matter itself is seen to have certain uh, have a certain mental quality out of which both material objects and conscious beings are made. And then you've got your mind brain identity theory in which mental states are the same thing as brain states. And then you've got your behaviorism in which mind is behavior, and behavior is usually seen as an activity of an organism which is made out of just physical stuff. Uh, and again, I'm going to focus on figures from the early 20th century, which is kind of where my main knowledge is at the moment. So we'll start with panpsychism. So of all the theories that I've talked about, I'm least comfortable with uh, classic panpsychism. The basic idea seems easy enough to understand, uh, but I haven't been able to make much sense of the writings by actual historical panpsychists for some reason. Uh, I'm going to try to focus today on Charles Augustus Strong. Charles Augustus Strong, uh, he was an American psychologist of the early 20th century, but it's important uh, to point out that Strong's panpsychism uses W.K. Clifford as a starting point. So it kind of begins with W.K. Clifford. There were other um, panpsychists before that, but um, W.K. Clifford was very influential in early 20th century uh, United States. For some reason, he was English. Um, but yeah, very influential. Uh, so let me say something first about Clifford. Uh, Clifford was an English philosopher <clears throat> and uh, he's rather hard to pin down. So he's somehow altogether an empiricist, a parallelist, and a panpsychist. So he kind of had influence in all these areas. Um, he once argued that all bits of matter, so every, all, every little bit of matter, comes with bits of what he called mind stuff attached to them. This was introduced in a famous article called On the Nature of Things in Themselves. This is an important article. Uh, referred to kind of in the late 19th century, early 20th century. I don't know if many people remember Clifford today um, or read this essay, but it's, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, very commonly known, very well known at the time on the nature of things in themselves, 1878. It was uh, published. So Clifford's theory of mind stuff seems to be a dualistic theory, or at least on uh, kind of first acquaintance, it seems dualistic. Um, either maybe substance dualism or property dualism, as I've uh, talked about in the previous episode on this topic. Uh, but the difference between Clifford's dualism and the dualisms that I talked about before is that standard, uh, standard dualists did not suppose that atoms and molecules have the beginnings of mind, generally speaking. Uh, Descartes, in fact, did not even think that non-human animals had minds, right? He thought animals were kinds of machines. Uh, and while William McDougall, who I talked about before, while William McDougall thought that even lower organisms had souls, he seemed to distinguish between living beings and inorganic matter. Inorganic matter. Uh, and so inorganic matter was subject to mechanical laws, while living beings could break these laws. And this seems to be um, uh, at least not the way the early panpsychists, it, panpsychists write about things. Um, and yeah, so for a dualist like McDougall, this law breaking of uh, living beings was what the concept of the soul explained. So it wouldn't make really make sense to have bits of the soul on non organic matter as well, because they might be breaking the laws of, uh, of mechanics. Uh, but I'm not quite sure how uh, McDougall thought about panpsychism or other dual uh, more classic dualists. 
Anyway, so if Clifford is a dualist, he's not a dualist in this uh, classic sense, like Descartes or McDougall or perhaps uh, Fullerton, who I talked about before, who was also quite influenced by Clifford. Um, so Clifford says that when matter gets organized in different ways, then the mind stuff that's attached to it gets organized in different ways too. So matter organized into the form of a human gives us human consciousness. Uh, but does uh, matter actually exist? Does it really exist? Uh, in, the same, in this same essay on the nature of things in themselves, uh, Clifford says that the universe consists entirely of mind stuff. So there's just mind stuff actually now. So uh, he writes that the reality external to our minds, which is represented in our minds, is a mat um, as matter. So the re reality that's represented ad as matter is in itself mind stuff. Uh, when he writes like this, he sounds more like a monist than a dualist, right? It sounds like there's just one kind of thing. There's just mind stuff and everything is made out of mind stuff, including matter. Um, so yeah, is mind stuff something extra attached to matter or is mind stuff all there is? Or is this um, a distinction for Clifford without a difference? I'm not sure what the correct answer is, is here really. So um, we'll go on to Strong, talking about Strong. So Strong is equally or you know even more <laughs> perplexing to me. Um, his motivation for exploring panpsychism seems easy enough to understand. So late in life, um, he wrote that if energy, and he took energy to be the fundamental substance in physics at the time. So if energy were not in its own being soulful or capable of awareness, no such thing as minds could ever arise. That's to say, um, the existence of minds requires that the basic elements they are made out of have on their own the capacity of awareness. Uh, this is not necessarily a good argument, I think, but it is at least a clear argument, and some of what's coming is not that clear to me. Strong mainly laid out his arguments for panpsychism in his books Why the Mind Has a Body and The Origin of Consciousness. Those were in 1903 and 1918. Um, I'll kind of rely mostly on the latter on his book The Origin of Consciousness, since it's a little bit clearer to me than the former. Yeah, Strong is very good at explaining other people's views and criticizing other people's views, but um, when it comes to explaining his own view, I get lost quickly. Uh, so, first of all, in Strong's view, um, one of the other appeals of panpsychism is that it seems to reconcile the other major dualistic theories of mind. Um, there was basically, um, at this time, there was basically um, the three kinds of dualisms that I talked about before. There was also materialism, and there was uh, panpsychism. Panpsychism's, panpsychism, he also calls a revised materialism. It's kind of a version of, uh, it has kind of the logic of materialism, except it, everything is kind of psychic. Um, and But it kind of reconciles, at least in his view, it reconciles all these other um, dualism. So in a certain way it reconciles, it's supposed to reconcile all the theories of mind, of materialism and all the kinds of dualism um, by its particular view of the psychic nature of reality. Uh, so the argument for this goes like this. Uh, so like parallelism, panpsychism claims that the mind does not act on the brain, but this is because the brain is made out of mind. This is one of the things I don't really understand. Um, on the other hand, like interactionism, the mind does interact with the non-cerebral parts of the body, so the non-brain parts of the body, and why there is a difference between the brain and the rest of the body in terms of their relation to mind, uh, this is not clear to me. I don't really get this part. But then there is epiphenomenalism also, right? So we had parallelism, interactionism, and then epiphenomenalism. And so Strong makes the distinction between consciousness on the one hand, and mind on the other, where consciousness is what he calls the function of awareness. Consciousness, in this sense, he says, is passive or inefficacious. So while the mind does affect the body, consciousness or awareness as a function does not affect the body. It's epiphenomenal, right? 
For strong interactionism, parallelism, and epiphenomenalism each have a kernel of truth then, and these kernels are kind of revealed and subsumed by uh, panpsychism. But then there is this mind stuff, this uh, mind stuff, this thing that is at the heart of Strong's theory, which he borrowed from Clifford. Uh, what is this mind stuff? Well, Strong points out that it has four characteristics, at least you know, in his view, he's got, it's got these four characteristics, uh, even though we, I mean, we can't see it or measure it, I guess, but um, just kind of intellectually, we can figure out that it's got these four characteristics. So the first and second characteristics are that it's in space and it's in time. And this right away distinguishes Strong from the dualists who generally believed that mind is inextended. They might think that it was you know, extended in time, but it was not extended in space for the dualists. Well, Strong is uh, kind of switching this up. He thinks the mind is both in time and in space. Um, but also, right, uh, my, so the, the third and fourth things, uh, characteristics of uh, mind stuff. So mind stuff is, thirdly, it's capable of change, so it can be changed uh, in certain ways. And the fourth characteristic is that it has a psychic character. So regarding its changeability, Strong says that mind stuff is in motion, so it moves, it moves around, and that this motion has something to do with our perceptions and feelings that I don't quite understand. Um, and regarding mind stuff's psychic character, he says that feeling, not necessarily felt and in, uh, or introspected feeling, is on the panpsychist theory the substance of the ego, and by consequence the substance of the world out of which the ego originates. And if you follow that, maybe you can explain it to me. So it's these third and fourth characteristics of mind stuff. Yeah, it's with these third and fourth characteristics that I kind of start getting lost. Uh, Strong sums up his theory by writing, if the ego, I guess he means here the self, the ego were not psychic, nothing would ever be given. And a psychic ego can come by evolution only out of a psychic world. So again, as I mentioned before, um, all of these theories are intended to appeal to science, even to evolution, the, even the dualists, the dualists were very concerned to couch their theory in evolutionary terms, in scientific terms, they're appealing to scientific evidence, to evidence, to evolution, um, but there's always this um, kind of supernatural element to their theories, either a soul that we can't, that doesn't follow the same laws as the rest of nature, or this kind of mind stuff that uh, we kind of logically know about, but we uh, you know, can't know about it really in an empirical way. Um, yeah, so he does think that uh, the mind evolves, but it evolves out of a psychic stuff, right? So not just out of matter, but out of kind of psychic matter, which is called mind stuff. Yeah, so I won't go into more details about this because I find that, um, uh, yeah, I just don't get it as well as I should to in order to very well explain it. It, uh, um, yeah, I don't have quite enough mind stuff of my own to make sense of it. So I'll leave it a little bit vague, but it's, uh, yeah, it could be worth looking into if you're interested in such things. Uh, so, but I do have to add that even though I personally um, find Strong's theory difficult to um, make sense of, um, although I kind of, I get why he is drawn to it, I just um, don't understand his explanation of it. But I should say that his work was very well received during his lifetime. While I was trying to research Strong, I read several very positive reviews of his work, you know, from this uh, early 20th century period. Um, but these reviews did not bring me very much closer to understanding Strong. But uh, yeah, it's just worth pointing out that other people, people who were much smarter than me, who had a better, uh, a better allotment of mind stuff, saw great merit in his work. 
Um, panpsychism, though, has continued to be a popular position. It was kind of waxed and waned over the years, but two recent philosophers who I often uh, think of in connection with panpsychism are Galen Strawson, who has actually cited Strong occasionally, and uh, Philip Goff is another uh, pretty well known right now in, well, at least in this kind of uh, parochial area of uh, philosophy of mind. Uh, so I may try to cover their ideas in the future since they're, um, they are easier for me to understand. But I want to move on, moving on to something a little bit easier for me to wrap my mind around, so to speak, which is the um, uh, mind, uh, what is it, the mind-brain identity theory, or uh, I'm going to also kind of call it neural correlationism or dual aspect theory. These are kind of related. They're not necessarily the same. Um, but at least in the theory that I'm going to talk about, they're the same thing. <clears throat> or at least uh, elements of the same theory. So this is the view that the mind-body problem is solved by looking at what's going on in the brain, which is up here, I think, in your skull. This is sometimes called you know, the mind-brain identity theory. And I'm going to consider the views of the psychologist Max Meyer. Max Meyer today. Meyer is sometimes considered an early behaviorist, though he uh, emphasized the brain more than the average behaviorist at the time. The behaviorists were kind of split on whether um, we needed to know much about the brain. Um, Meyer was uh, very interested in the brain. And he was especially interested in finding the neural correlates of mental states. You might have heard this term if, you're, uh, if you pay attention to kind of modern uh, philosophy of mind or neuroscience. People like to talk about neural correlates. The basic idea is that for each mental state, there is a corresponding brain state. Uh, for the organism that has a brain state, this brain state has a subjective aspect. So the brain state is objective, right? It's something that everyone can see if they looked in the right place. Um, but for the person having it, it's got a subjective aspect. So I think of uh, Meyer's theory as both a kind of neural correlationism or brain, a mind-brain identity theory, and as a dual aspect theory. And this can be considered a kind of monism because it assumes there's just one kind of stuff. And this stuff has both objective and subjective aspects depending on where you're standing. Again, brain states are objective because we can observe them and measure them. And, uh, you know, multiple people can do this. But for the organism which has, which actually has the brain state, these brain states have a certain subjective or inner quality, which is how the organism knows that they're having a brain state. Um, this view is perhaps expressed most clearly in the last chapter of Meyer's book, The Fundamental Laws of Human Behavior. Meyer's has a, at least a couple of really um, important books, well-known books. One of them is The Fundamental Laws of Human Behavior, which I'm mostly talking about today. Um, this theory is not unlike the theory of Thomas Huxley, which I discussed on a previous episode, or of other 19th century scientists. This was kind of a common, uh, a common idea. Huxley thought consciousness, if you heard my previous episode, Huxley thought consciousness was a function of the brain, which meant for him that it was caused by the brain in the same way that movement is caused by contractions of the muscle. Contractions of muscles, usually more than one. Um, likewise, Meyer argued that we have good reason to believe that a mental state never occurs unless there is at the same time a nervous process taking its path through the higher nerve centers. And I suppose by higher nerve centers, he means something like the prefrontal cortex, or at least certain parts of the cortex. But the relation is probably not causal in the way that Huxley thought. So Meyer thinks it's more likely that brain states and, brain states and mental states are strictly simultaneous, um, though he acknowledges that the technology of the time did not allow scientists to actually prove this. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering if that sounds a little bit like parallelism. Could be. I mean, it does sound a little bit. I think I'm, I'll maybe mention this later on. It does sound a little bit. There is a kind of parallelistic aspect to this. Um, so if brain states and mental states are strictly simultaneous, then Meyer says that we have a right to describe them by saying that they are really only one phenomenon occurring in the world but that this phenomenon has two aspects. And this is why I'm 
I've described Meyer's theory as a dual aspect theory, which is just another popular kind of uh, um, theory of the mind. Uh, yeah, so uh, so it's both kind of a mind-brain identity theory and a dual aspect theory. You could also think of this as a kind of naturalized or collapsed parallelism. Yeah, so I want to bring out maybe it's um, uh, that flavor of parallelism a little bit. Since in parallelism, mind and body do not have a cause-effect relation, but are somehow tied together so that they change simultaneously. Uh, but whereas in traditional parallelism, mind and body are two different kinds of things, of course, right? There was this um, non-material substance that was the mind. In dual aspect theory, they are just one kind of thing that can be experienced in two different kind of ways. So as an objective, you can experience a brain state objectively or subjectively, depending on kind of how you're looking at it or whether, and whether or not you are the organism who is having the brain state. Um, a brain state is objective because anyone can observe it if they have the right instruments. I've mentioned this already. Uh, but insofar as the brain state is only known by the person having the brain state, like I am having my brain state right now and you are having your brain state, those brains, respective brain states are subjective for each person having it. Any brain state is potentially objective. Anyone can observe any brain state, giving the tools and the opportunity to do so. Uh, but not all brain states are known subjectively. Only brain states that occur in very high nerve centers can be known subjectively for the person who's having them. So we don't know all of our brain states, right? We don't feel all our brain states, just some of them. And they have to reach to a certain, a certain point, a certain area of the brain, which uh, I don't think Meyer speculated too much about at the time because uh, this was 1911. Um, but yeah, there's many sp more specific theories today, of course, because we know somewhat more about the brain. Uh, the reason why Meyer is also a behaviorist is because he points out that we don't ordinarily observe each other's brain states, but we do attribute mental states to each other. And what's going on here? So we don't observe brain states, but we attribute mental states. Well, what we're normally interested in explaining is each other's behaviors. So that's what we're really interested in, is what we are going to do, what other people are going to do, and what we're going to do. Uh, Meyer uses the example of a boy who has put a plank on a streetcar track, so laid down a kind of a wooden plank or something on a streetcar track, and this has caused the derailment of the streetcar. We want to know why the boy did what he did. Normally, all we can know is what he did. We can observe what he did or... Um, to figure out what he did based on the evidence there. Um, and we can know the effect of what he did, and we can know his explanation. We can ask him, why did you do this? And we can know his explanation. Uh, so, but was he putting the plank on the track? Was the, I mean, was, uh, was this putting of the plank on the track? Um, was this an action intended to save or to harm, right? You can, there's maybe different reasons. He might give us one reason, but there are many, um, you know, if we kind of exclude his testimony, there are multiple reasons why someone might put a plank onto a streetcar track. Um, so what we, what, we, what we want to know, what we really want to know is what type of an act it was. Right, this will give us the explanation of it. The true reason for the boy's action is to be found uh, really only in his brain states, which are inaccessible both to us and to him. So we can't um, actually access his brain states under normal conditions, and neither can he. So we're both kind of uh, trying to explain what happened without access to the brain states. So we attribute to him a mental state. This is just kind of a convenience. We attribute to him a mental state. Either he wanted to save the streetcar from a bigger danger ahead, or he wanted to hurt someone on the streetcar. And we attribute um, this mental state to him as a convenient substitute for the brain state that neither we nor he has access to. In other words, um, because the true causes of our behavior are hidden in our brains, we attribute mental states to each other as a way of explaining and predicting what we're going to do. And this reminds me of Huxley's view, actually, that consciousness is a symbol of what's going on in the brain. Right. 
So we've kind of invented uh, mental states to help us figure out what people are doing since we don't have access to their brain states. We don't have access to sort of the true causes of their behavior. So we kind of make up this idea of uh, mental states. But it has to be pointed out that Meyer's behaviorism is, although it has kind of this behavior element to it, it's very different from the behaviorism of people like John Watson and B.F. Skinner. Uh, Watson and Skinner focused much more on the environment as the cause of behavior. And Skinner in particular thought it was much more useful to focus on the environment as a cause of behavior because we can observe and control the environment much more easily, perhaps ethically, than we can observe and control someone's nervous system. Um, and I would say that Meyer's position on the mind is pretty standard stuff today. Uh, many scientists are still searching for what they call the neural correlates of consciousness. And the idea that uh, mental states are just brain states is quite common among scientists and philosophers. Uh, yeah, just a very, very common, common idea. Uh, but let's finish up by looking at behaviorism. I've been talking too long, I feel like. But let's finish up by looking at behaviorism. I know more about behaviorism than about the other theories I've mentioned, so I'll speak a little bit more generally here. I won't focus so much on one person, but I'll try to tie together a few different ideas from different people. Um, behaviorists are not necessarily monists, but most behaviorists have, I think, been monists of a materialistic variety. So maybe they're kind of my, my stand-ins for materialists here. Although they're, um, yeah, I haven't talked, I didn't really talk about materialists. I didn't find a good, um, so far, a good representative of materialism in the early 20th century. Um, lots of people like to argue against the materialists, but um, uh, it's hard. I'm sure there are some, but <laughs> I haven't come across a big name. But maybe the behaviorists will kind of count as my de facto materialists, although not all behaviorists are necessarily materialists. Um, so, uh, but generally, I guess they, um, generally they think that living organisms are made out of ultimate materials that are not themselves alive or conscious, but when you put them together in certain ways, they create systems, right? These you know, kind of inorganic materials create systems or organisms that we call alive and perhaps conscious. Behaviorists mostly think that there is no good reason to speak of atoms and smaller particles as being alive or conscious, like panpsychists. So I've never seen a behaviorist subscribe to a notion like mind stuff. So maybe we'll call them materialists. But naturalists would be a better word for behaviorists than materialists, um, I think. Behaviorism is generally, yeah, has generally been identified with materialism materialism but like i said i don't think this needs to be the case behaviorism uh, only really seems incompatible with traditional traditional dualism uh, it seems to me that what a that a behaviorist could be a panpsychist um, a panpsychic monist or could be some uh, you know a pluralist believing that there's different kinds of just different kinds of things irreducibly in the universe uh, dewey john dewey for example who i'd argue was a behaviorist uh, a behaviorist was not uh, too interested in the nature of the fundamental particles that make up the universe. Uh, he was a naturalist. He called himself a naturalist and was uh, generally opposed to dualism on logical grounds. But he was not opposed to the idea that the universe was made up of uh, you know, many different kinds of substances. Uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, who was also a kind of uh, proto-behaviorist, not exactly a behaviorist, but there was many behavioristic elements in his ideas. He held views that were compatible with panpsychism, some views that were, I think, compatible with panpsychism. He thought everything in the universe was governed by habit and that matter was mind that had been rigidly fixed by habit. Uh, and this is a complex and uh, hard to interpret idea that I won't try to totally explain here but it's you know, interesting to, to read about. And, you know, perhaps we could uh, think of pan-behaviorism rather than panpsychism, given how important uh, habit was to his thought. 
Dewey also had said some similar things, and there's uh, some uh, some grounds maybe for a pan-behaviorist theory of reality, which would probably be similar to uh, universal Darwinism, if you know the idea of general or universal Darwinism. Uh, maybe I'll look at, take a look at that at an, uh, another day, but uh, for now, going on, um, yeah, well, to sum up, I guess, basically, whether the ultimate constituents of the universe can best be described as mental or physical uh, was not a really important issue for most behaviorists. Um, but behaviorists were pretty much united in thinking that what we call animal, the animal or human mind, was a kind of behavior. The mind is not simply brain activity, though it requires brain activity in uh, creatures that have brains, but instead behaviorists see mind as some part of the organism's response to its environment. But of course the devil is in the details here. The early, um, one early behaviorist, um, Edgar Arthur Singer Jr., thought that mind was a concept we use to explain the fact that different organisms and different kinds of organisms show different ranges of behavior. We tend to think that uh, organisms that show a greater variety of behavior, a greater variety of ways to achieve a certain goal, a certain purpose um, that we can observe, we tend to think that they have more of a mind than other organisms or a better developed mind or something. But the word mind here just describes this fact that some organisms have a greater variety of ways to achieve self-preservation and other subsidiary goals than other organisms. It doesn't refer to something that exists in and of itself. It's um, a little bit like the, the concept of mental state for Meyer. It's something that helps us explain, um, but it doesn't actually exist per se. Uh, and then the standard subcategories of mind are just subcategories of behavior. So psychologists and philosophers will talk about mental states or mental processes like perception, emotion, thought, memory, and so on. Behaviorists understand all of these things to be doings, behavings, of the organism. Emotion, for example, is an attitude resulting from the effects of the organism's actions on the organism itself. Memory is just a reinstatement of the bodily conditions of perception in the absence of the external object of perception. And uh, thought is uh, subtle actions of the voluntary muscles. And uh, yeah, and so on and so on. These ideas come uh, that I'm mentioning here come out of the writings of people like John Dewey, George Herbert Mead, Edgar Singer Jr., John Watson, Edwin B. Holt, uh, B. F. Skinner, and others. Uh, basically, the only so-called mental state that could not be reduced to behavior, I don't know if reduced is the right word, or translated into behavior, uh, was sensation. Sensation can be a tricky problem. Uh, sensation was generally conceived, I think, as a brute uh, mechanical change to the organism, especially the organism's sense receptors. And uh, we could describe sensation as the maybe the afferent so afferent, afferent uh, side of uh, nerve activity, which um, I mean, uh, you know, traveling, nerve activity traveling from the sense receptor to the brain, as opposed to from the brain to the sense receptors. Um, in higher organisms, such as humans, these sensations don't usually affect us very directly. So we're not directly responding to sensations normally, oh, sometimes we are. Um, sensation is usually, uh, well, what matters to the um, what matters really to humans and uh, probably most animals are the perceptions that are made out of these mechanical changes to the receptors, uh, sense receptors. And per perception involves habit and muscle action. So sensation is usually mediated through perception. Uh, we don't build up our world out of sensations because we're uh, almost always acting in situations that are at least partly familiar Higher organisms mostly perceive objects, not quality, not kind of these uh, simple qualities of the world, supposed simple qualities of the world or qualia. Uh, humans, at least, analyze qualities out of objects when the situation becomes problematic. So um, the qualities are kind of uh, you know a secondary element in the situation that we um, kind of start to perceive when we need to. But normally we're dealing with objects and kind of whole situations. Uh, but this analysis, 
of qualia, as uh, philosophers like to call them, is a form of behavior. So when we think about questions like, do I prefer, prefer this shade of blue or that shade of blue for my outfit? How does this blue make me feel? Um, we're stimulating ourselves to act in terms of some quality, which we're carefully analyzing out of some larger situation. So uh, what we don't do is we don't have the sensations first, and um, we don't have the different kinds of sensations first, and then build up situations out of them. We're kind of in the situation, and then if we need to, we analyze um, these uh, sensations out of the situation. But on the other hand, if we find ourselves in some very strange situation, we might have very vague sensations of brightness and darkness, redness, greenness, silence, loudness, etc. These different kinds of um, this kind of more simple uh, sensations, maybe. Um, but even here, these relatively primary sensations are not just passively received. We're actively trying to figure out what they are, what's going on, what do they mean, uh, so that we know how to behave. So we're pass we're not passively sensing them. We're trying to perceive them. Right? We may not have a good perception of them yet, but we're trying to turn them into perception, into objects, into a situation that we. Uh, can interpret and figure out how to act in. So the discrimination of qualia, things like hardness, blueness, sourness, etc. The discrimination of these kinds of things is a behavioral act, though this discrimination has an apparently non-behavioral basis in just mechanical changes to sense receptors and to nerve signals going to the brain and things like that. We might say that the material causes of qualia are found in the physics and chemistry of the world and the biology of the organism, you know, the idea of material causes. So we need to have, um, in or order to have sensations, we need uh, kind of the physical and chemical properties of the world and the biological properties of ourselves. Um, but the efficient causes of qualia are to be found in the behavior of the organism. The thing that actually makes these qualia happen to us is um, in our behavior. It's behavioral in relation uh, as a relation of the organism to the environment. And this maybe makes more sense if you know your Aristotle and your different kinds of Aristotelian causes. Um, but in short, coming to the conclusion now, uh, from, from a behavioristic perspective, we can think of mind as a general term covering many more specific terms like perception, emotion, thought, and so on, which have fairly straightforward behavioral explanations. Uh, the advantage of behaviorism is that we can avoid a lot of metaphysical speculation about stuff that can't actually be observed, such as immaterial souls or quasi-material mind stuff, and we can avoid speculation about what science may ultimately tell us about the brain, which seems to me one of the most uh, seems to be one of the most complicated objects in the known universe. All right. To conclude, perhaps my uh, bias <laughs> comes out at the end there. Being a naturalist, my own views are closer to Myers and to the behaviorists. I have a lot of sympathy for the dualists who were basically trying to reconcile older religious or spiritualist views of the human being with newer scientific ones. I have a certain sympathy also for the idea of panpsychism, even though I can't make much sense out of um, early 20th century defenses of it, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot that we don't understand about the nature of, uh, but there's, you know, you know, thinking in terms of panpsychism, there is a lot we don't know about the uh, nature of uh, atomic and subatomic particles. I think it's uh, I think it's possible to explain life and mind as emerging from non-living and non-mental entities. But how much continuity versus how much discontinuity there is between uh, the living and the non-living is still a matter of debate. So it could be much more continuous than we're uh, and like a materialist might think, or maybe not a materialist. But um, you know, if you think that life emerges from the non-living, uh, there may be more continuity there than we're uh, used to thinking. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there, there may just be kind of an absolute um, discontinuity there at some point where you just get totally non-living stuff, non-stuff uh, um, that doesn't have ex any experience at all totally. And then out of that, you get stuff that is living and has experiences. 
But uh, yeah, the nature of the continuity or discontinuity there, uh, I think we just don't uh, know enough yet, or it's still very debatable. So personally, I would probably find a pan-behaviorism, as hinted at by the early pragma pragmatists, uh, more satisfactory than a panpsychism. But um, yeah, this uh, pan-behaviorist proposal will have to wait for another time. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. That's all for today, so have a good one. Bye for now.